Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, can we start or should we wait? We'll start, um, uh, Rosalyn. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. We are felicitating Stanford. The Bible says, the Lord has done great things and he has made everything beautiful in his right time. Good evening to one and all. I'm Dr. J. Felicity of London, Assistant Professor of PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Trichy. On behalf of management and head and faculty members of PG and Research Department of Chemistry, I'm happy to welcome you all for the fifth and the final day of five days international level online faculty development program on artificial intelligence and chemistry, the current trends and future perspectives. Dear participants, kindly note, kindly mute your audio and video throughout the session. Do not make any kind of interruptions during the session. Kindly post your queries in the chat box. It will be answered at the end of the session. Participants kindly note the feedback link will be posted at the end of the valedictory function. Filling up our feedback form is mandatory to receive the certificate. Prayer is a two-way conversation that enhances our communication with God. It is not for the, for the someone to listen, but it is to strengthen your faith in God. Let us invoke God's blessings through this prayer song. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time through the darkest. Shadows all around. Do not fear, He will guide you, He will keep you safe and sound. He has promised to never leave you, nor forsake you, and His word is true. God is good all the time. Put a song of praise in this heart. Artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. Biomarkers are defined as measurable characteristics that are indicators of biological processes, pathogenic processes, or responses to interventions. Nowadays, artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches have been developed to detect novel biomarkers and interactions in complex data sets. 
I'm happy to invite the today's resource person, Ms. Madhengi Tyagarajan, the proud alumina of PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Trichy. She is going to enlighten us on the topic, Artificial Intelligence for Proteogenomics and Biomarker Discovery. Madam has started her career as a biochemist in Apollo Hospitals, Chennai in the year 1997. Ma'am has joined as a research assistant in the Functional MRI Lab, New Jersey, New York in the year 2000. At present, Ma'am is a project director in Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, USA. Ma'am has more than 20 years of rich and extensive experience in the field of multiomics and bioinformatics and 11 years of experience in managing oncology programs. Ma'am has proven record in successfully managing a portfolio of complex research programs as a product project director, interacting with multiple stakeholders, subcontractors, and mentoring project managers. Ma'am has strong operational leadership, leadership experience with success in building cultures, nurturing teams with focus and accountability, leading to exceptional service delivery to internal and external customers. Ma'am has authored more than 50 peer-reviewed scientific publications. And Ma'am is also a certified project management professional. Ma'am has won several awards, including FNLCR's Customer Relations Award 2021 and NCI Directors Award 2021 for outstanding leadership are notable. I'm very much honored to welcome a highly creative, detail-oriented and multidisciplinary leader to this faculty development program. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ms. Felicita. Uh, it's been a very, very warm welcome. Uh, I accord a genial welcome to Reverend Sister Dr. Annie Xavier, Secretary, Holy Cross College, who constantly extend her support in all our endeavors. I feel honored in offering a cheerful welcome to Reverend Sister Dr. Isabella Rajakumari, Principal Holy Cross College. Sister always believes that greater heights can be achieved by powerful weapon prayer. We welcome you, dear sister. I extend a warm welcome to our beloved head of the department, Dr. A. Lima Rose, who always epitomized the time of will over constraints. I accord a cordial welcome to all the participants from various colleges. I extend a cheerful welcome to all the faculty members of chemistry department, Holy Cross College, who always put in sincere efforts in providing a stimulating environment for the successful conduct of all the events. Once again, I welcome you all. Now, I hand over the session to Ms. Madhanki Yagarajan. Thank you so much, Ms. Felicita, for that very, very warm welcome Thank coming you, back and uh, giving a, a talk with Holy Cross is literally like coming back home. Uh, I just came to India and visited my parents and then talking to you all feels like coming back home again. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna quickly share my screen and I wanna make sure everyone can see it. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a little background about myself. I am the most proud alumni of Holy Cross. Um, I always keep coming back to Holy Cross. It's such a warm and nurturing environment. I did graduate in 1995, 92 to 95 batch. And um, I ever since I left Holy Cross, every year when I come back to India, I would come visit Holy Cross. I would visit friends. I would visit teachers. And that kind of environment that Holy Cross had created really kept me in touch with what's going on in Holy Cross and, and be in touch and be a resource for the future students. So I'm very, very proud to be able to do that. Um, as I was um, introduced, I did my chemistry in Holy Cross, which literally laid my foundation in science on anything that I did. Uh, even now, I go back to some of my, my chemistry books and my biochemistry books, because the foundation that was laid uh, really got me to where I am. And uh, it uh, continues to help me excel in what I do. Um, I work for the National Cancer Institute, Frederick National Laboratory, which is a prime contractor uh, for the government doing a lot of research work. And my focus is primarily cancer research. 
Um, however, um, we subcontract a lot of these work and me and my team manage a lot of these work. Um, our primary goal is collecting samples for proteogenomics, which I will explain in a little bit. I gave a talk a couple of years ago at Holy Cross exclusively on proteogenomics. So I will try to be a little different this time and not touch on the same topics. But uh, with some introduction of that, I am going to touch on something that we've been tackling more recently, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning for all the data that comes out of proteogenomics towards biomarker discovery. So the agenda for my talk today is to introduce my program that I manage, which is called CPTAC. It's called Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium. As the name suggests, it is not run by one group. It is a consortium, which means there are multiple groups involved. We firmly believe that people with different talents, different expertise, when they all brought together, um, they bring out the best science. I will talk a little bit about the workflow and the components that we manage and the different proteogenomic analysis, because that is the foundation of everything that we do. These produce very big data and analyzing these data and mining these data and sharing it appropriately uh, with all the regulatory work uh, with all the stakeholders is pretty important. So we uh, put significant effort in building an infrastructure to analyze this data and share it with all of our consortium members. And more recently, we've started to do quite a bit of artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, we have groups that specialize in these and we have in-house projects that are more recent. Uh, but we have seen phenomenal success in applying AI and ML techniques to proteogenomics uh, because of the volume of the data and the different newer algorithms um, that has come um, that is going to revolutionize any future research. And we have already, we are very close to publishing a paper. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in this talk and how this is going to help us with biomarker discovery as well as uh, uh, in finding therapeutic targets. Um, I will focus a little bit on deep learning, um, uh, which is part of uh, machine learning uh, with an example as part of the artificial intelligence work that we have started to do. And the importance of why this is so uh, critical at this time uh, in understanding cancer and uh, how um, we can really take this to the next level. Because uh, when it comes to cancer, I don't think there is anybody um, in this world who's not been touched by cancer or has not been impacted by cancer. Uh, it might be a friend, it might be a family, it can be a neighbor. Uh, there are so many who've been impacted with cancer and it is so important to understand this deadly disease, this complex disease at the molecular level and see everything uh, we possibly could do in terms of not just lab work, but also computational work that can be used and that can go hand in hand with the lab work that we do uh, in order to tackle this disease and uh, identify markers that can move in for clinical trials towards uh, medicines as well as drugs that can either contain the cancer or cure cancer. Um, a little bit of a background about CPTAC, the program that I manage. Our goal is to characterize 23 different tumor types. As many of you all know, cancer is not one disease based on the organ, based on the type, stage. Um, it, it, is, it manifests into a completely different beast. Uh, our goal is to collect samples from patients who've suffered from cancer. We have a very strict protocol that we wrote uh, we started this phase of assessing the technology um, way back in 20, uh, 2006 to 2011. Every five years becomes a phase. And then we started to understand and study each one of these tumor types. So in phase two, we did colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer. And then we moved to phase three, where we were tackling the more prevalent cancers, which is lung uh, uterine cancer, kidney, brain, glioblastoma, pancreatic, head and neck, sarcoma, melanoma, and the acute myeloid leukemia. So now we are in the next phase of, of CPTAC program where we are targeting very rare tumors. These are extremely rare. They are very hard to collect. We are also focusing on um, pediatric cancers as well as um, um, cancers that we can eventually get into early phase clinical trials. So our goal is to basically collect these samples, understand the cancer basically using omic technology. So omic technology is a very broad term. 
Um, there are many different omic technologies that are in place now, right from genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics. There are so many omics technologies um, that are in place now uh, where we can take a sample and run it through this um, uh, technology and uh, generate some data. And these are very, very large amount of data. And our goal is that we will we can mine this data into something more meaningful that would tell us more about the cancer, either at the tumor level or at a person level, uh, which is what precision medicine is all about. So our goal is to identify all this information, combine them, apply some uh, techniques and computational methods, and see how we can diagnose cancer better, prevent them, or treat them. So the group's goal was to collect like from 45 different um, cases that we identified, 200 cases per tumor type, characterize them. We obtain clinical data. We obtain about 250 or so data points from each patient and integrate all of this information, the imaging data, genomic data, proteomic data, um, and all of the clinical data and see how we can identify and use AI and advanced computational strategies for biomarker discovery. So in context, um, the imaging data, these are both radiology data. So when a patient goes uh, for, for a cancer um, a screening test, the first thing that they do is an MRI um, or they run some radiology images. And once a sample is given, um, the sample is um, put on a plate, dyed, and we do what is called a histopathology image. The goal is to look at the sample and identify what kind of cancer it is, how aggressive it is, what needs to be done. So basically diagnosis. And this is where more recently we have been using a lot of computational methods, especially machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, in rather than looking at the images and and making interpretation, we are able to apply these models and make a more informed decision because many times patients may not have the time or the money or the means to do several lab assays and genomics and proteomics. Sometimes a simple image, a simple MRI scan, a simple DICOM image uh, will give tremendous amount of information that can really change the trajectory of that cancer treatment. So. Early diagnosis, accurate diagnosis is extremely critical in the, this kind of a disease for which we have been using a lot of models. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Genomics is, uh, has been in, in, in place for a very long time and, has, and it has been proven uh, to be an extraordinary resource for identifying more information about the cancer, primarily because many of these cancers are genetic, they are genetic disease. The, the information about what it's going to do and what kind it is, is engraved in the gene, in the DNA, in the RNA. And fundamentally, when normal cells become cancer cells, a mutation happens, and that is at a genetic level. So understanding why that happens, understanding the fundamental root cause for that is extremely important to make sure that the correct therapy is advised for the patient. So understanding the genetic makeup of either the cancer or the patient or both uh, will be extremely valuable. So let's keep that aside. Now, where does proteomics come into place? We know genes becomes proteins, but proteins eventually are the targets for the drugs or for the medicine that is given for these patients. So we might ask why um, when we give a specific chemo um, drug, why it works for some patients and why it does not work for some other patients. So that's where proteomics plays a role. Uh, there could be something about the protein function in that patient that has made the drug not work. So understanding the proteomic um, makeup of the tumor as well as the patient uh, will be extremely valuable. And understanding that at tumor level will at least know uh, will tell us what drugs to target or what drugs should at least get into FDA for uh, for the next round. So these are different things. They do different things. Image data, genomic data, proteomic data. Now, CPTAC tries to take a sample, uh, does imaging, pulverize the material. We do genomic sequencing, and then we do proteomics mass spectrometry. We try to do all these things with the same sample and our goal is to combine the information that we get from imaging, that we get from genomics, and proteomics. We try to 
combine all these. And sometimes, I mean, we also do multi-omics like lipidomics and metabolomics. It's just been quite popular. And also single nuclei sequencing, which helps a lot in understanding the tumor microenvironment. So our goal is rather than seeing these things separately, we want to see them put it together and have a very fast pipeline um, that we can run. So we don't do things in, in, in sequential, we do things in parallel. And we try to see how they compare and contrast. Where does genomics tell us that proteomics is not able to? And where does proteomics tell us? Where, where do they confirm each other? Where do they contradict each other? And what does that tell us? So invariably, we have learned that any of these technologies individually gives us a partial picture of the tumor. It does not give us the complete picture. There are still some gaps. And by combining them properly and by applying um, some computational methods and analysis, we are able to fill in that gap and we are able to, it's like a puzzle where we fill in the puzzle and then the picture is more complete. And that's how we are able to um, target, we are able to identify vulnerabilities in the tumor that would enable us to uh, go for therapeutics based on those vulnerabilities that can go in for, for uh, drug selection. So our goal for CPTAC is to identify a variety of these samples, um, characterize them, analyze them, combine all this information, and provide recommendations uh, to the scientific community on how some of uh, the cancer can be improved, um, the detection can be improved, and how it can be prevented, and um, if it cannot be prevented, how it can be treated. So the different questions that we try to ask from these tumor types are, are there genomic aberrations that are detectable at the protein level? What is the protein's function? Because at the end of the day, we want to know what are the drivers and what are the passengers at the genetic level that causes cancer or that makes cancer metastatic, that makes cancer grow and takes over a person. So understanding those biological mechanisms can only be done at a genetic so uh, making sure that we uh, characterize these samples and understand them and answer some of these questions, such as, as I said, why do some, uh, some chemotherapy work for some patients? Why it does not work for some? Are there protein targets that we can go after? Are there poorly, uh, newly discovered subtypes that can tell us a um, little more about that cancer and as to why it is so difficult to, to tackle based on existing medications? So some of these, unless it is, uh, th there is a saying that goes, you know, we can't just cure the symptom. We have to go to the root cause. Otherwise, it keeps coming back, right? So our goal for the program is to go to the root cause, but not take too much time and understand it completely so we can provide valuable information to the scientific community on this. So this is just an example of why proteomics is important. This is a, 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 a picture of... Uh, an analysis where we had identified three different subtypes from just RNA sequencing, which is transcriptomics. But when we did proteomic analysis, we were able to identify two additional subtypes, which we would have missed at just at the genetic level. So it just tells us that one technology is not enough. We need multiple technology and we need methods to combine them together in a reliable manner to get the complete picture. So this is just our workflow. We, we subcontract with uh, 30 different hospitals across the globe uh, to collect these samples based on a protocol. All the samples come to a central location where we quality control them. And then we, um, we, pulp, we path qualify them, pathology qualify them, and then we um, um, aliquot them, and then we characterize them. Once we characterize them, we run it through our sequences for genomics, and then we run it through mass and the analysis results are then combined. We apply a lot of computational algorithms and the information is finally shared with our consortium, with our community, where we have clinicians, oncologists, statisticians, uh, and analysts who look at the data and make interpretations and then we publish the paper. These are different components. I'm not going to go too much in detail, but um, just to say that it's a very complex workflow that we manage. Uh, but the goal is to have a reliable set of data that we um, These are the different places where we collect samples from. As you can see, we do have some uh, racial disparity. It's been very difficult to get samples from uh, underserved minority population, which is something we are trying to fix in this round of our program. And also, there are some cancers that are caused due to environmental factors because of pollution, because of 
uh, exposure or uh, occupational hazard and getting that kind of information or if the if the sample is coming from a place where there is a river and that river has a contamination that has caused cancer having that kind of information and making sure that we we include the clinical data we include the the metadata along with the actual genomic and proteomic data um, is is really important for us to make sure that we make these accurate so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on imaging. This is where um, we have used artificial intelligence and machine learning a lot because, first of all, it's cheap. We don't have to run any assays. It doesn't take time. All of the cancer patients go through um, some image data, and those are easily available. Uh, looking at it with an naked eye or with a microscope or you know, with, with any of the current tools does not provide as much information about the cancer. However, we have so much, so much data, image data that we have collected in the past that we are able to build computational models on them that would predict how a cancer is going to grow in the next several weeks or months for that patient. And that kind of information is so critical for the, the physician or the oncologist who's treating the patient who can um, anticipate what kind of um, therapy or treatment or drug the patient can be put that would be best for the patient. So this is very low, um, um, low key in terms of it's not expensive. It can easily be done. And I won't say it is 100% accurate because it is still an image. It is not a molecular assay. Molecular assays are a lot more uh, reliable than an image. Uh, there could be some false positives. However, it is still that can be done quickly. So we never miss an opportunity to run our algorithms on images and uh, infer some information. It has provided great insights on tumor heterogeneity, especially, and uh, targeted treatments, where, where to target for better delivery um, of what the drug will have an impact on the patient. So I'm going back to our original diagram of what we do in terms of the image data that we get. And we use both radiology images as well as histopathology images. Genomics is very, very standard. We get these uh, tissue samples, tumor samples, and then we extract DNA and RNA from it. And then we run a, C a series of analysis on them, starting from whole exome, whole genome, um, methylation assays. Uh, we look for expression data, basically. We look what has altered. What has altered at a genetic level that has caused the cancer? This is not... Um, it used to be a very expensive process and a time-consuming process, but nowadays genomics is like people have a laptop and a little sequencer in their uh, table that can run and we can sequence a genome in like $1,000 in, in a couple of days. So it is a little expensive for the common public. However, it provides so much information about the genetic makeup of the tumor that the patient has gotten that um, can be incredibly valuable rather than hearing uh, you know, what the patient is going through in terms of uh, diagnosis, if we can sequence the patient's genome or at least compare the, the um, information that they have against a database that already has information about the tumor that's been sequenced, then that provides incredible information for the physician to go the right path in terms of suggesting a treatment as well as a drug. Proteomics is again at the protein level. This is literally our bread and butter. We are a proteomics group and uh, we run mass spectrometry where we do these proteins are digested and we run it on liquid chromatography and uh, we are able to identify uh, the proteins uh, and the subtypes. These are identified and the levels are then uh, analyzed and we then compare it against a protein database, we then compare it against the genomic sequence, and we are able to make um, some inferences. So we combine it at a global level as well as as a possible level, and uh, we combine this information um, eventually with genomics. So why is it important to combine these two? Because they, they really target two different things, and uh, it is really important that we combine the information and uh, try to understand if it contradicts, we clearly know why it contradicts because it, there is some alteration at a protein level that needs to be studied further. If it confirms, then that is definitely reproducibility for this kind of data. And we have had extreme um, 
test in terms of identifying when we combine the genomic and proteomic data from the exact same sample. It has to be from the exact same sample. Then we are able to really prioritize what are the driver mutations, what kind of drugs should we target, and what kind of uh, uh, post-translation modification are we expecting that can be used for uh, functional biomarkers as well as what events have to be targeted um, with these drug therapies. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much details here, but it's just to show how the DNA uh, with these aberration becomes an mRNA and then moves and becomes protein. But protein is where we target. The cancer drugs targets the protein. So understanding that phenotype is, is really, really important. But we, we are able to at least identify uh, for each of those tumor types which ones to target. So um, whether the patient should be given a, a chemotherapy or, or uh, whether the patient should go to immunotherapy or any other pharmacological therapy can only be determined if we have this kind of an understanding of the tumor. Uh, these are the different types of analysis that we do. Uh, again, some of these are uh, very, very standard. We have a workflow to do the variant calling. Variant calling as in we take the cancer genome and then we no, and then we see where there are variations, where there are indels, where there are fusions, where there are mutations. And uh, we, these are done in a very, very fast manner because of all the computational techniques that we have in place. Uh, and it provides us very good information, but it's a lot of data. And then I'll quickly come to the big data that we have to deal with. Uh, this is the same. We do quite a bit of protein-protein correlation as well as uh, uh, regulatory correlation that can provide us uh, where we need to target based on the gene expressions from the genomic sequencing. Um, integrative modeling is something we do. Uh, once we have these data generated, it's important for us to cluster the data and we do what is called predictive modeling. Um, this is extremely valuable for us to understand what uh, markers have been identified, what have been missed, what we need to go after, what's the diagnosis and prognosis, and, uh, how we can um, enrich or remodel them uh, and reanalyze them. Um, something that we eventually feed into our AI models are the network modeling. So the protein-protein interaction uh, from the phospho right from the RNA to the proteome to the phosphoproteome eventually into the network um, is uh, that kind of correlation would really tell us what the outliers are and what the biases are and um, would provide us more information about what we need to target. Uh, we do have several data sharing and visualization um, tools that we have built. Um, the goal is, you know, sometimes a picture uh, is worth a thousand words. We are able to like load these into tools that we'll be able to visualize and identify the, the places where there are changes, there are mutations, there are issues that we need. And all of this data, um, once we publish, are publicly available um, at these websites. We, we call it the data commons. So the genomic data is available at gdc.cancer.gov, which is genomic data commons, the proteomic data at pdccancer.gov. We have imaging data um, at imaging data commons, and then we have several analysis tools. Even though these are different portals by the US government, they all kind of talk to each other. Um, we, we have like a central data commons where some of some, the data can be different, but uh, some of these identifiers can be linked together. So the, even the public data that are available for researchers to download and analyze um, can talk to each other and it can be connected with each other. And we also have some cloud resources where we can load our data set into the cloud and do these analysis. And these are the different clouds that we have available. Um, we have, again, um, everything is on the cloud, the clinical data, proteomic, genomic, imaging, immuno-oncology, uh, marker data from all of the previous programs that we have worked on. All of these are loaded in the, into the cloud. So a person can just like log in and uh, look at the data, analyze the data, and make interpretations. Now we have a lot of modeling as well as tools development done on the cloud, and that is made available to the researchers too. So this is the paper that I originally, when I was contacted uh, to give this talk, I, I wanted to talk about this a lot, uh, but this is not, um, I mean, I have an online version, but this is not even published. It's, it's getting published tomorrow. It's going out tomorrow. So I'm not able to talk too much about the inner details of it. I have to wait. Um, but this was um, 
this was a, a project that I ended up working where we were able to prove how artificial intelligence, especially, uh, is able to assist and help with rapid diagnosis and potential treatment of endometrial cancer. This is the cancer in the in the uterus. Um, so we basically collected 138 uh, tumor samples from from um, females with uh, uterine cancer. And we also had some adjacent normal, enriched adjacent normal that we were able to use as our control uh, for the comparison. Our goal was to do multi-omics, uh, which we did whole exome, whole genome methylation, RNA-seq, miRNA, proteome, uh, several targeted assay, phosphoacetylene and, and glycosylation. Uh, so right, it, it, we, we generated so much data, but uh, we had very less time to, in terms of identifying and mining all this information, and that's when we were using machine learning approaches. Um, the highlights of, uh, again, I can't talk about the actual algorithm because it's still not published, but um, with, with, with permission from my team, I'm just going to give some highlights where um, we were able to identify some of these markers like APM status. It was accurately determined uh, using a targeted assay. And MYC, which is a cancer-causing gene, um, its activity, it is a potential biomarker which was not known before, and it does... Um, you know, we are able to contain it and, and activate uh, if it is activated with metformin treatment, which is basically a drug that is given for type 2 diabetes. Um, again, there are like few other um, genes that we were able to identify um, that uh, especially the one with beta catenin degradation. And this is just to say that um, when, when we get a lot of data and we have very less time, I mean, time is always of essence. Um, you know, discovery cannot wait. There are people dying, so we have to um, we have to do what we can to use our algorithms and computational methods uh, to analyze and mine the data as fast as possible. That's going to give us valuable information. And in this case, we also use some machine learning approaches to identify and predict um, very very uh, clearly predict molecular features uh, just from the biopsy tissue. The biopsy tissue had to go through different images. And, um, you know, ra rather than just a doctor seeing it under the microscope, we were able to run our algorithm and we were able to identify so much more molecular features that would have taken for a, a very long time to identify, um, especially if the patient cannot go through all the assays, then uh, just image alone provides so much information when we use some of our algorithms. So the, we did use a lot of deep learning methods here to, to combine the information from proteomics, genomics, as well as imaging. And uh, the goal is you know, to, to ask questions and model this data in such a way that we can identify uh, which what kind of immunotherapy can be given to a specific patient. I mean, that is precision medicine. Identifying, not, we can't have a one-size-fit-all. We need to these are very, very minor changes that can make a world of a change when it comes to identifying what's the right therapy for a patient. So the more data, the better, and the better we can mine them and provide um, additional information um, is what we are trying to do. And we were all also able to prove that the possibility of measuring this MYC uh, cancer-causing gene uh, would tell us whether that uh, patient would benefit from, from metformin treatment. And of course, we were able to... Um, um, come up with predictive models to, to predict so many molecular features that can eventually go in for, uh, for targeted assays as well as um, uh, drug um, identification uh, from, from just the images. So as you can see, um, we, we used assays, proteomics, we used the MYC uh, determination genomics, and we used images for these uh, using these predictive models. We were able to use all these three, imaging, genomics, proteomics, and uh, on top of it, when we layer it with computational methods um, and when we can train our machines to, to uh, mine the information, then we get something phenomenal uh, in a very short time, which is the next future. Um, this is just another uh, area where we are continuing to work on uh, for artificial intelligence, which is stem cells. Um, as, as we all know, um, we all have cells in our body and not all of, I mean, cancer cells uh, to be specific, but they don't, they don't act up. They are normal cells now, but you never know when a, a normal cell can become a cancer cell. So that change of 
the the embryoid body becoming an adult cell and uh, you know there are some events that happen when that adult cell becomes carcin carcinogenic which is cancerous and then there are, there are some events that will cause that carcinogenic in situ to a carcinoma and then it takes over the normal cell and it it spreads and it basically kills a person so the the identification of which cells will become like this is something you know that we cannot just uh, wait uh, for the patient to tell us how things are going or just run lab tests. We have so much data now that uh, we have to use artificial intelligence um, and, and network models to um, identify which ones are likely to, to grow into that stage and how we can either stop them, um, suppress them, or, or counter them before it gets to that stage. Um, is the whole point of uh, applying artificial intelligence um, in the oncogenic uh, progression. So these are, again, different uh, algorithms that we have developed. One is the OCLR, which is the one plus logistic regression uh, machine learning algorithm. And this is to extract the features from transcriptomics as well as, as, as epigenetics uh, in order to identify which ones are the, the stem cells that are likely to uh, de-differentiate from an undifferentiated um, um, cell. When do they become de-differentiated? When do they, they, they? So it's it's a lot of information if we think about it. But then cancer is not one disease. Cancer is not one kind of disease. Uh, there are so many modifications that happens to cancer, um, which we call as hallmarks of cancer. Um, you know, it's not enough if a cancer, you know, is mutated. It has to have that, um, you know, it has to suppress the tumor suppressor. It has to avoid the immune destruction. It, it, it goes through phases. It has to resist cell death. I mean, the whole point of cancer is it grows, and grows uncontrollably. So which means it has to, cells cannot die. It has to move on. So there are different hallmarks or features of cancer and every permutation combination can make it into some, com something completely different, which is why it is so difficult to cure cancer because um, every patient is a little different and you know, how uh, cancer literally beats us. When, when we try to like tackle it, it tackles us basically. It's such a smart disease, uh, which, is, which is very sad. So we don't have time, which means we need to use computational methods. Why is it so important to to use some of these algorithms for making some reliable and fast decision is that it is so complicated and we are always against time that um, building infrastructures where we can plug in and get as much information as possible uh, is really important that would enable a, a, a physician, an oncologist to make meaningful decisions for the patient. And um, this is again, since the paper that we were working on were not was not published at that time. I had this as an additional one. This is from a different group in Germany. Um, but this is just to show why uh, when we have these multi-omic data, um, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, uh, these are all the multi-omic data. And then on the side, we have image data. We have electronic health record, the history of the patient, um, what kind of genetic makeup that they have, whether they are parents, uh, had cancer, um, whether they had smoking history, alcohol history, um, um, making sure that we have all of their exposure, or occupation, whether the patient was exposed to any radiation, whether the patient was exposed to um, any other environmental factors. So collecting all this information and uh, making sure that we mine all the available information in the databases, none of this is an easy task. So unless we have a very strong infrastructure in place in terms of applying these algorithms, machine learning and deep learning algorithms, um, it's going to take a very long time, very sequential in order to put all this together. So there is a huge stress in why um, AI, ML and DL uh, have to be implemented in a much higher level, in a much faster level, in 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 uh, not just on the research front, but also in in the clinical uh, front. I mean, that is literally um, we call it as bedside to bedside, bringing information from the bench, from a lab to the bed clinician. I mean, patients should be able to go into a hospital 
and then you know do some of these analysis real time. If we have some of these infrastructure, they should be able to um, request some of these analysis to be done real time on their samples and produce some results in a fast manner that can predict what kind of um, treatment and therapy that they can be given. And eventually this would also help in, in newer drugs that can, that can come into play. Um, so again, for biomarker discovery in the past, we used statistics, we basically collected tissues, biopsies, and then we had shotgun sequencing, proteomics, genomics, um, and then we had different cohorts, a discovery cohort when we discover something, and then a confirmatory cohort where we confirm what we discovered. And we were just doing them systematically in using statistics. We were just trying to identify, okay, now what changed? Uh, what did not change? What did we find newer things? And you know, how is this study specific? What That kind of work. But now we are getting into more uh, machine learning uh, as well as artificial intelligence, where we want to jump ahead. We want to see how the disease is likely to progress. We want to we want these models to tell us what the path is going to be, so we can beat that and go ahead of that. And um, uh, the the correlation maps, especially the between the proteins and the clinical uh, factors, will really you know give us this information. Okay, if this patient had this and this and this, then it is likely to be this. Then what else can we do? So that kind of information we want, and we want it fast. And uh, having some of these models, because this humongous amount of data, just like ChatGPT, I mean, we the more data we have, the better the models are going to be. The better the models are, the better our decision support is going to be in uh, what kind of uh, treatment. Um, the patient can receive. So this is literally democratizing the uh, data that, that we collect and applying the right models and uh, inferring some valuable information that can help clinicians uh, make some, some key decisions. So um, that is all I have in terms of um, giving you all an overview of proteomics, genomics, imaging, and how we collect samples and how we characterize, analyze, and share them, and our newer um, um, methods of applying um, machine learning and artificial intelligence on the cancer data towards identifying biomarkers in a more reliable manner, as well as uh, identifying therapeutic vulnerabilities for targeted drug development. Uh, which is definitely the next uh, big phase. Our goal is to make sure that these don't stick and stay at a, at a research molecular level, but they move into the clinical trials and they move more on the, on the patient side. Uh, definitely would like to thank uh, National Cancer Institute's OCCPR, my program, and Frederick National Labs, my team, and the entire consortium for the opportunity that I had to work with a variety of people on, on some uh, really cutting edge technology as well as computational methods that has been extremely rewarding. And this is just a really, really good time for the convergence of science because um, we, can, we can very easily get siloed. We have a lot of big data. We have all these things separate. Um, but if we don't combine them together, if we don't you know, let them question each other and ask those questions in, in combining them, we can miss out on a lot of information. So to converge any of these large volumes of data, we absolutely need uh, advanced computational uh, methods, which is what we are currently working on. And that's my contact. And I thank you all for your time. Um, thank you, ma'am, for sharing your knowledge on artificial intelligence for proteogenomics and biomarker discovery. Your session was inspiring and highly informative. Dear participants, kindly post your queries in the chat box. Participants, kindly post your queries in the chat box. Can, okay, there was a question, can household chemicals cause cancer? So this is a very, very, um, um, you know, commonly asked question. I mean, there are so many people say, oh, don't use um, microwave popcorn, it can cause cancer. Don't um, uh, use plastic uh, in microwave, it'll cause cancer. Don't uh, use uh, this chemical, that, uh, you know, chemicals to clean, it can cause cancer. 
there is no one reason that can cause cancer. So cancer, as I said, is not one disease. It's not like, oh, the sugar level goes up, now we have diabetes. No, it's not like that. Um, I am known of people who've had a mutation in them, but there's a sequence. That's why, that's why I showed that uh, image of the hallmarks of cancer. Um, it is a sequence of events. It is not in, enough if there is an oncogene in the body. Let's say, let's say a chemical goes into our body and then it won't immediately cause cancer, but then it is sitting inside. At a later time, let's say something else cap happens and then that would trigger this. And then something else happens and then that would trigger this. And then suddenly our immunity goes down and then, uh, you know, all these things, toxins that we would have otherwise expelled from our body would manifest and suddenly it will start expressing. So there is no uh, answer that this chemical caused cancer, that chemical caused cancer. Yes, they are all some, there is a reason that these things are hazardous and it ha we have to be careful. But um, the important thing is that cancer is a very complex disease where there are a lot of events that needs to happen for it to become a cancer. Even then, there are a lot of low, low grade cancer, where if you identify them immediately, like starting stage breast cancer, you can immediately remove the breast or, you know, give drugs and, um, you know, it can be cured before it spreads. Um, so, uh, yes, there is no one answer, but there are definitely some chemicals that can be one of the reasons that can eventually cause cancer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the another question is, can cancer be identified and treated in the early stage itself with the help of AI? Yes, absolutely. That is the whole point of AI is early detection. I mean, we, we have all the information early on. We, uh, It's a very tricky question. Can cancer be treated? It depends on the cancer. It depends on the stage of the cancer. It depends on the histologic type of the cancer. There are some cancer that are well studied that if you identify them immediately, a pill, a chemo can be given and then it kills it. But then there are some cancers that no matter what, it's not going to go away because um, it, there are so many different types of cancer. So it is really dependent on the type, but there is no doubt that the earlier detection goes a very long way. It is always easy to cure something before it has happened or at the beginning stages of it has happened before it spreads and, and takes over the body. So AI definitely will help in that because AI is nothing but our human brain, you know, trained in a way with all the calculations and information that we can apply faster. So I think um, this is going to be a breakthrough in cancer research because earlier detection always helps. The reason why the mortality or the survival rate is so high for uterine or, or even uh, early stage breast cancer is because of early detection. Right now, people do mammograms. Um, the colorectal cancer that are like colon screening. So there are so many people who died out of these cancer because they were just not detected. They didn't know. I mean, they didn't know that they had cancer, right? So this kind of information, the sooner it goes to the patient and the physician, the better it is for the survival of the patient. Yes, ma'am. The next question is, how metformin act on cancer, which is a drug is for diabetes? It doesn't act on cancer, but that is what we identified. It, it actually acts on the activity of one gene. So metformin is only used for diabetes, but incidentally, it's it has a secondary thing to act on an MYC gene where it controls that MYC gene and that eventually um, prevents cancer from spreading. So that is why this kind of combining information is really important because we can identify that we might be giving a medication for one thing, but it might actually either be fixing something else or it can actually be like um, messing something up. Um, so that's what we identified that metformin was actually helping um, in terms of the MYC activation. Yes, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Akila want to know the role of uh, metroindazole and statins in cancer causing agents. I don't know. I don't know that. I'm not aware of it. Sorry. And uh, another question, Dr. C. Uma Maheshwari has asked, have uh, witnessed pediatric, pediatric cancer in my family at very small age, as early as two years. What may be the reason for pediatric cancer as none of our family had it? 
So it, it is, it's a very valid question. Um, not every cancer <laughs> is genetic. Um, some are genetic, some are environmental, some are both. Um, sometimes, as I said, we all have cancer causing um, genes in us, except that we have so much normal cells that, it, you know, the cancer is not acting up. Cancer is nothing. It's just, a, I would call cancer a rogue form of a normal gene. Suddenly, the normal cell, if it acts up and goes uncontrollable and does crazy things, that is cancer, right? So many of these things are genetic, yes, and, you know, maybe the parents may not have it or the grandparents might. It can come through generations, but some of these are environmental. That is why smoking causes cancer, because when a person smokes, there might be nobody in the family with cancer, but that um, smoke you know, causes a charring in the lung and that can mutate a gene and that can cause cancer. So for a child, you know, who's two years old, there is absolutely, you know, no um, reason for that child to get cancer, which is why pediatric cancer must be extensively studied because we really don't know why a child that small might get cancer. But it is also incredibly difficult because we don't have that many samples. We, there are so many adults who are dying of cancer. We can get these samples, analyze them, but it's very difficult to get samples from, from a child. Uh, we don't have that many. So that is one area that is very understudied. And um, there is a lot of um, um, funding now to study uh, childhood cancer. Um, many are actually curable, uh, especially ALL is the form of cancer that is um, more easily curable, but there are some, uh, especially uh, brain cancer, that is not easily curable. And um, it, it is very difficult to pinpoint what might be the reason. We have to really look at uh, many different factors, including genetic makeup uh, for a very long time. Sometimes we don't know why people die. We may not know it's cancer, but it might have been, especially in the previous generation, because diagnosis was not accurate at that time. And uh, we don't have, um, we didn't have as much data and, and AI like we do now. Thank you, ma'am. There is another question. Ma'am, one side, medical technology has Himalayan growth, and the other side, so many people died due to various types of cancer. How to reach this type of technology to affected person? So that's a very, very interesting, valid question. Um, in fact, this is something that we face every year with budget. When, when people, when we take, um, you know, taxpayers' dollars for research, people would say, oh, so much money is spent on research and why do people still die? Why do so many people still die? And the reason is I wouldn't say that so many people, more people are dying now. I would just say we know more about why people are dying now, which we did not before. Earlier in the days, people, you know, life expectancy was like 60, 70, 80 years old. Right now, people are living like 90 plus. Right now, people have the means to treat. People know they have cancer. I mean, I heard that one of my great grandfather died out of some stomach. And maybe he had like stomach cancer, which we didn't know. There was no diagnosis. So it's not that we have more cancer now. It's that we know more about it now that we are able to pinpoint what the disease is. So it makes it seem like we have more. It's not. We have only reduced cancer. We have reduced cancer based on three reasons. One is early detection. <laughs> None of them underwent any mammogram or colon screening in the past. But right now, I don't know how it is in India, but in the US, any woman 40 plus must go through every year mammogram. And so many are saved from breast cancer because of early detection. Um, so there are many such preventive measures that are in place that has only caused the, the number to go down in terms of cancer and also drugs. I mean, the people might still eventually die, but their lifestyle and the survival curve has increased because of uh, better drugs and, um, you know, using of technology and making sure that we have all the information and the right treatment path. They have all only uh, helped in, uh, in uh, a, a better survival for the patients. So I wouldn't agree that more people are dying now. I would just say that it, it's getting better and we still have more work to do. Yes, thank you, ma'am. There is another question. Does proteomics accept data based only on experimental values? If not, then how much empirical, theoretical, or intuitive value is accepted for modeling? 
No, we does not only uh, take experimental values. We do have um, other values that are added to these models. And um, that is also another field that is um, changing a lot more recently. Um, so even though we have these um, uh, targeted sample-based data, we have what is called the global data where we are able to add information based on multiple uh, pan-can information that are combined together. So we across the board are able to identify which ones are the drivers and, and, and passenger mutations. <laughs> Participants, any more questions? Oh, I'm happy to see that that family member survived due to earlier detection. Yes, yes. yes. it is. It is awesome. Um, I think this early detection and uh, the knowledge uh, is so critical because uh, it can really save lives um, knowing it earlier. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. I extend my special gratitude to our resource person, Ms. Madhangi Yagarajan, Project Director in Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research. Ma'am, you clearly explained about the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, Omic Technologies and Workflow, Proteogenomic Analysis, and Biomarker Discovery. Thank you, ma'am, for taking the time away from your pressing commitments. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. It is my pleasure. Yes, ma'am. Now we move on to valedictory function. I hand over the session to Dr. Vidya, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Trichy. Thank you, ma'am. You can't teach people everything they need to know. The best you can do is position them where they can find what they need to know, when they need to know, says Seymour Packard. Esteemed chief guest, faculty members, and research scholars, a pleasant and happy evening to you all. On behalf of the management, PG and research department of chemistry, I'm profusely overjoyed to welcome you all to the valedictory function of our five-day international level online faculty development program on artificial intelligence in chemistry, current trends and future perspectives. The promotion of research in a huge and diverse country like India will help the nation evolve as a knowledge reservoir in the international arena. Keeping this in mind, the Department of Chemistry Holy Cross College plays a key role in the establishment of the vision of the department to explore fundamental and applied chemistry concept in responses to challenges and problems faced by sciences, society, and industry through the organization of seminars, conferences, and FPPs, and also chooses people who are icons, mentors, role model in helping us to reach the excellence. One such person is our chief guest, engineer Abjit Nikaj, senior director, data science and analytics, Felabella, Bangalore, India. Engineer Abjit Nikaj is a data science leader with over 16 years of rich experience, leading high performing teams across various sectors, ranging from retail, semiconductor manufacturing and energy. Sir obtained his bachelor degree in engineering from PESIT in Bangalore and completed his post graduation in engineering and management from Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and Massachusetts Institute of Technology USA. Before joining Falabella, Sir worked as a techno functional manager at Target Corporation, Walmart e commerce, and at Sandus in San Francisco Bay Area. Later, he joined Falabella India Private Limited, where he is working as Senior Director of Data Science and Analytics. His role over there is to build products that leverage machine learning algorithms to enhance the capabilities and the efficiency of Falabella.com. I am indeed proud and privileged in welcoming such a wonderful personality on behalf of everyone, extend a cordial welcome to you, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you, madam. I appreciate the warm welcome. 
I welcome all the faculty members, research scholars, and our guest of honor in this virtual meet for the valedictory session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, I hope I'm audible and visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so uh, thanks again for the warm welcome. And I also want to thank uh, at the outset, uh, Shri Ranjini, uh, who's a good friend and uh, she uh, connected me to you. Uh, and I have the opportunity to talk in front of all of you. Um, you know, I was uh, looking up Holy Cross College and its details uh, in preparation uh, and was very inspired uh, that uh, from 1920 onwards or even 1900s onwards, uh, the Institute has pioneered women's education and has created uh, such um, so much impact in the country. Uh, you know, it to be a visionary and to promote women's education uh, and to then promote excellence, um, the way you're doing it through these type of seminars and uh, faculty development programs, uh, it's really praiseworthy and uh, inspiring. Uh, so I first extend, uh, you know, my gratitude for this opportunity to speak in front of you, right? <clears throat> now, um, I'm not a, a chemistry professional. Uh, I'm not even a PhD. So uh, many of you here are uh, experts in your domain. Uh, many of you are um, deep in your domains. Uh, and when I got this opportunity, for a moment, I hesitated. You know, what can somebody who has not dealt in uh, these domains speak to you all about? Uh, I've worked on AI. I've worked on machine learning. Uh, but um, is it is it transferable? Can I talk something which can add value to you all? <clears throat> so, so that led me to kind of go past in my history. And then I realized actually I have spent some time doing a bit of chemistry and that was in Indian Institute of Science. So I did my master's in instrumentation department. Um, and my research topic was to build a chemical sensor to detect methane gas. And uh, so we used techniques like sputtering and we uh, deposited uh, zinc oxide and uh, with that, we could detect methane gas. And then we did a lot of post-processing after that. So that was a long time ago in 2004, 2005. Uh, but uh, brought back fond memories. And as a consequence, uh, what I did was uh, I wrote to my professor this Teacher's Day on September 5th and wished him happy Teacher's Day and led to a happy coincidence. He replied and we'll probably meet uh, next week. So again, I need to thank uh, this opportunity for reconnecting and rekindling my connection with my guide at IASC. Okay, so what can I talk about? Let me first begin uh, by setting the context of how AI has evolved and where we are today. And then you're all educators here. How can you think about AI? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, while grooming your students for the world of research and for the world of uh, profession, right? So I assume people who graduate from your university and college uh, either go join companies or they go and join to do their PhD and do research, right? So as educators, how can you uh, empower your students in this world of AI? So I think that is going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, I'll talk for a brief period, and then we can have questions or anything uh, as it goes forward, right? Uh, so let's, let's kind of, uh, it's always useful to take a historical view of a domain and how it has evolved to current stage before kind of thinking um, what to do and how to kind of tackle it, right? So um, the word AI was coined back in 1960s uh, at MIT. And uh, 
there was a conference, I believe there was some uh, important scientists, Marvin Minsky and others, they all came together and said, okay, can we make machines to think? And um, if so, what does thinking mean? And so they coined this term artificial intelligence, right? And then at various stages, a lot of efforts were put in, in the domain of AI to make machines think. So that was the whole crux of this field, right? Uh, and this field has gone through many um, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. So initially everybody were excited, you know, machines can think, they can do everything. So let's figure out. And they tried to initially start making machines think through what is called symbolic language. They said, okay, I will give some symbols. And as long as those symbols can be interpreted by machines, and it can map to um, uh, a certain set of problems or class of problems, I will solve that and then machines can think. That turned out to be computationally complex, uh, not tractable, and then people gave that up. Then after that, over a period of 10, 15 years, everybody said AI is a failed science. Nobody needs to touch it. It's useless, right? And then, for a long period of time, it was called the first AI winter, right? And then late 80s, there was a revival of this domain. There were newer techniques of probabilistic analysis that came into play and uh, newer algorithms came into play and some microprocessors with better computing capabilities came into play. And again, there was a big hoopla that machines can think. You know, there were some initial chess playing programs which were developed and uh, those play programs were pretty good not not super good they could not defeat the best players uh, but they were reasonable and then everybody again started doing research on ai right um that lasted for another 10 and odd years but still they realized that you know the computational requirements for us to um, kind of do the artificial intelligence or run the artificial intelligence algorithms was prohibitively expensive and there were better techniques. So again, AI went out of fashion. So that was the second AI winter, right? So that was the second phase. And then there was this third phase, which kind of started uh, mid 2000s, okay? And it started evolving because of a few reasons. One is there came this idea that you don't need to have a very powerful computer in your house or in your university. You can have it distributed elsewhere and you can connect to that computer or a group of computers and do your computations. So the cloud technology, right? So that gave immense computing capability to, um, to a lot of people and that enabled us to, you know, crunch numbers and do certain types of, uh, you know, process certain types of algorithms. So that was the first thing which changed in the world in kind of late 2000s, the first decade of 2000, right? The second thing which happened was, you know, internet became more and more prevalent and that generated a lots and lots of data. So once we had a lot of data which came in, um, you know, these algorithms suddenly started performing better. The same algorithm, you have just a little more computing capability, but you're feeding it with a lot more good data. So the algorithm started becoming better, giving more reasonable results. The third thing which kind of helped in this domain was, uh, you know, a lot of Initially, building these algorithms and running these algorithms required you to be a PhD in statistics and machine learning. But then over a period of time, this open source software movement came and a lot of these computations were encapsulated in packages and given out free, right? So earlier, if I had to do like a certain class of uh, uh, algorithms, I would have had to have MATLAB and I would have had to pay about 10, 15 lakhs for the license of MATLAB and only I could do it. But then with Python, 
the same algorithms and same functions are available for free right so so these three factors came together and now we have again ai in fashion and ai is evolving and ai is thriving okay so i just wanted to give you this idea of three phases of ai going in and out of fashion and look at today's world in that context right <clears throat> so now if you have to think about it how is the world the world is rich with data right even in your domain in chemistry people are generating data by various means empirical research a lot of people are doing it a lot of <coughs> machine generated data is coming up so a lot of data is generated everywhere um the second thing of course is now we have ability to do computation on that data and the expertise level for you to do something like a deep learning model or any of that which dr mathing was talking about that expertise there is still a dis, no requirement for high level of expertise but it is not the same as what it was say two decades ago or a decade ago you know so that is the context <clears throat> now with that i have to say that in the last 5 years this field has taken off a lot more you know it's now almost impossible for any person even an expert in this domain to keep pace with the changes in this field you have a new large language model like chat gpt coming every week or every two weeks and the one is beating the other and people still don't know how these models work right but they work they take a lot of data and um they take a, i i see a hand raised um senthil uh no sir strongly okay okay no worries <clears throat> let me let me continue so so there is a lot of data which is coming in new models are coming in every day um there you don't understand how they actually work but they're giving reasonable results so that is the phase we are in now as educators and as uh, molders of future generation how should we prepare the future generation in this context to be effective in you know a world where ai permeates a lot of our uh, research a lot of our decisioning so that is the question which we have to deal with okay um so i i kind of presented the context and the complication now i'll kind of tell you um what my position in this is and this is an opinionated position may be shared by all may not be shared by all but i have an opinion on these things so i would feel that the first thing that we need to do for our students to be functional and effective in ai world is to understand how to kind of interpret the output of an algorithm <coughs> so we spend a lot of time um you know teaching people about machine learning we uh, in in when we are teaching machine learning um and then we teach them a lot about the details of an algorithm but at the end of the day today most of these algorithms themselves are encapsulated as functions which can anybody anybody can use with one line of code right two lines of code but what's important is you know the machine throws a result now how do you interpret it is that machine result good is a machine result bad how do we, how do i evaluate that now that becomes an important skill that our students of the future generations need to understand right like let's let's take a non chemistry or a non scientific example you now trust google maps right now in trichy if i have to go from point a to point b and google maps shows me a way do i trust it implicitly or do i have a better sense of evaluating it and if so how do i evaluate it right so 
that is one thing evaluation of an output of an algorithm in the context of your domain is an important skill so i would feel like say as chemistry professionals you should have your chemistry fundamentals very strong and then you have to approach the outputs of the algorithm against these fundamentals and evaluate it question it challenge it don't accept it as is i think this is one important skill whether you are an ai professional or non ai professional it's very important that we instill in our students right that is that is number one uh that's one recommendation i have the second recommendation i have is you know all these algorithms are only as good as the data that you feed into it you feed it random let me give you an example from the world of chat initially microsoft developed a chatbot okay and they released that chatbot on twitter and you know twitter is a place where people can be very abusive they can use abusive language so within a day or two the chatbot started becoming extremely racist it started using very bad and racist uh conversations now this is an example from the world of random chats and we all can understand but now take it to the world of your research in your world of research um if somebody fed a really bad experimental data into your into a bunch of deep learning models and none of us understand what the deep learning model is doing essentially or how it's transforming and taking decisions and then come up with beautiful slides and beautiful graphs and come up with certain conclusions how do we um you know how do we uh, deal with this correct so essentially you will have to train people to understand data itself forget machine learning algorithm how do i kind of look at a data which is generated by an empirical research or anywhere else and evaluate the quality of the data that i'm feeding into the model so i think that is the second skill which i would say that you have to instill in your students and that skill comes from pure statistics in my opinion um irrespective of how important machine learning can become irrespective of how important uh, all these fancy terms can become for us to be able to analyze data using pure statistics for us to make sense of that data using pure statistics is an important skill so i would say we should all emphasize that our students have strong fundamentals in statistics and can analyze and interpret data very well so two things i told you first is interpret the output of the algorithm based on your domain expertise second is to interpret the input to the algorithm based on um based on your um, data qu quality itself so then the third thing that i would posit for you all is to consider this domain called causal inference now we are all scientists we've all done research now establishing causality is a very important aspect right now what does causality mean let us say i'll i'll kind of take a detour and kind of present it to you in basic terms imagine it's morning 6 o'clock alarm rings and you shut the alarm and the sound of alarm stops you can at this stage state that you pressing that alarm button off caused that sound to stop correct but there are many aspects which are unsaid in this what if the battery had not died down at the same time right so what if the phone had um uh, you know suddenly gone bad right so all of these are variables which can impact the same outcome and for us to say something caused something else 
we have to isolate it from all these confounding variables. And causal inference is the science which helps us do this in a systematic manner. And this is a field of data science which hasn't got great amount of publicity, but it's extremely useful and is being pursued by all the great companies in the world, um, be it Google, be it, um, uh, be it uh, Uber and a lot of these commercial companies. And I'm sure they're being pursued deeply by all the um, you know, pharmaceutical companies. So this domain of causal inference, I would say, is a domain which people can understand and can build, develop during their undergrad dates itself. It's not extremely complex to start on this domain. I would say that we as educators should encourage our students and teach them this specific domain, right? Um, and my view, personal view, is that this domain is going to become more and more important because especially in the domains in which you are in, there are impacts, societal human impacts of your decisions. And these decisions, you can't trust and say that an AI model gave this, so it is true. You will have to establish causality between any intervention that you do and the outcome. So this domain becomes more and more important for researchers like you. Right. So I would say, uh, as educators, um, let us focus on these three domains and let us enable our students to be capable of dealing with uh, the world of AI as it evolves. And let's enable them or empower them to be great researchers in their respective and chosen fields using these capabilities. Right. Um, as an aside, if anybody wants to get started in this domain of causal inference, um, I would say there is a beautiful book by a professor called Udaya Pearl. It's called The Book of Why. It's very readable. Any, uh, it's, <coughs> it's written in a very non-technical, non-mathematical way. I would recommend everybody to just read that book. And that will give them a very good intuitive understanding of the domain. And then you can, again, use, uh, you know, pre-computed functions in Python and everywhere else in your domain, once you have the intuitive understanding of the domain. Okay. So, so I'll leave you guys with these three things. Um, it was, uh, you know, as it was a short conversation that I wanted to have, and I hope this gives you some takeaways and, uh, you can use that. Uh, and as educators and as students too, because we are all educators and students at the same time to survive and thrive in the world of AI. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for your wonderful talk on uh, functional and effective for the understanding of our input and output of the algorithm and how to interpret the input and output of the algorithm, which is a uh, important skill and uh, your uh, talk on the three important domains are all very fruitful to us. Thank you, sir. <coughs> now I invite Dr. J. Roslyn Vimala, Assistant Professor and the Organizing Secretary of this FTP to read over the report of the program. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The end of an event begun with a purpose. It does not signify finishing or closing, but completion, accomplishment, and even the beginning of a significant actions motivated by the impact induced by the event. A very good evening to one and all gathered here. I present before you the report of the various sessions of our five days international level online faculty development program on Artificial Intelligence in Chemistry, Current Trends and Future Perspectives organized by the PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Trichy, from 4th to 9th September 2023. The objective of the FTP is to provide a platform for researchers, chemists, biologists and all the academicians 
us to come to know the applications of AI in chemistry, the challenges and limitations of AI in chemistry, the future of chemistry with the integration of AI, and the advancement and the crucial role of AI in the future of scientific discovery. The program commenced by the welcome address by Dr. A. Lima Rose, Associate Professor and Head, PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Ritchie, and the convener of this FDP. Dr. Dawson N. Arul Murugan, Associate Professor, the NeuraCare Laboratory, Department of Computational Biology, Indra Prasada Institute of Information Technology, New Delhi, India, inaugurated the program and spoke about doing science with computers in his inaugural address, followed by his talk on applications of AI-based approaches for drug discovery and materials design. It was holistic as it gave a coverage on computational drug discovery, its challenges, various approaches available for binding affinity predictions, the success and failures of force file based approaches and the development of quantum mechanics, its fragmentation based and data driven approaches for binding affinity prediction. On 5th September, Dr. Madhavan Jacob, the assistant professor of chemistry, Loyola College, Chennai, spoke on the topic pros and cons of AI in learning chemical sciences. He detailed on the ability of machines to act in seemingly intelligent ways, making decisions in response to new inputs with AI implementations, the design and experimental effort have proven to dramatically reduce, thus improves efficiency. It has reduced errors, the 24 into seven availability. It has led to fast decisions, new inventions, cost reduction, but the other side of it is that it led to job displacement and cost and complexity. Dr. Sri Ranjini Arumugam, Head Projects Management, Seed Lisbeck, Germany, on 7th September 2023, spoke on AI in the era of quantum computing for chemists. Significance of artificial intelligence, quantum computing and quantum computers, the realm of quantum AI in the futuristic direction, and the applications of quantum AI in the chemistry, which enables chemists to be more faster and creative in their research, are the glimpses of our talk. On 8th September, a talk on AI, the next chapter in chemistry, was delivered by eminent speaker Dr. Parthipan Srinivasan, the visiting faculty of data science and engineering at ISA Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, India, and the CEO of Inyani Chennai, highlighted the paradigm shift in science, the current trends in the use of AI in chemistry, the vitality of data science, which has become the art of creating new knowledge, that is, the fourth paradigm science, and the future of chemistry is language. Large language models could be the catalyst for new era of chemistry. On 9th September, Ms. Madhangi Tyagarajan, MS, Project Director, Biospecimen Research Group, Frederick, National Laboratory for Cancer Research, USA, delivered a session on the topic artificial intelligence for proteogenomics and biomarker discovery. She elaborated on what is clinical proteomic tumor analysis consortium, its workflow and components, proteogenomic data analysis data, data mining and sharing, artificial intelligence for proteogenomics and biomarker discovery, deep learning benefits and importance of AI in machine learning and understanding cancer. The validatory address was delivered by engineer Abhijit Nirkaj, Senior Director, Data Science and Analy Analy Analytics, Falabella, Bengaluru, India. He briefed how coining of the word AI came into existence, the evolution revolution of AI, the contributions made in this domain, and also emphasized that students should be enriched in interpreting the mission data, the output of the algorithm, which is an important skill to be developed. Another thing is that in the world of research, inserted in deep learning models, coming out with conclusion, how do we deal with essentially people needs to be trained to evaluate the quality of the data, irrespective of how machine learning is important and also cost inference needs to be made. The FDP was appreciated as a timely and valuable event by the resource people. The FDP received a lot of positive feedback from faculty members and research scholars from many colleges and universities of India. There are nearly 175 enthusiastic participants from Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, Uttaranchal, Manipur, Puducherry, 
Gujarat, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, including Tamil Nadu, who took part in the five-day online FDP program. Each session was of 60 minutes and included open question and answer session. Google Meet and YouTube was a platform used and the feedback form links were shared every day at the end of the presentation. This five-day online FDP come certificate program was an extraordinary event with huge success and this event will be a landmark in the field of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. May I request one or two participants uh, unmute yourself and uh, kindly give your feedback. I once again repeat, I request one or two participants unmute yourself and kindly give your feedback about this FTP. Hello. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Uh, th uh, this is uh, Dr. Sandil Kumar from ESA College of Engineering and Technology, Coimbatore, ma'am. All these five days, uh, actually, uh, what I thought in the online program, it's a nearly a wonderful program, ma'am. Actually, each and every speaker is uh, what to say that it's an extraordinary. Uh, the, the, not only for researchers, those who are involved in research, those who are in faculty, uh, faculties uh, in those who have any idea for research are continuing in research uh, everyone is benefited everyone will be benefited all the sessions were great uh, i personally thank all the organizers for such a great event thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you is there anyone want to record your feedback Hello, good evening, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Dr. Sambika from my Antimotion College of Engineering in Peru. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. We hear you. Yes, ma'am. We, uh, we have to thank you for this uh, recognition of this uh, event because we are usually attending and like regarding chemistry and uh, what is regarding type of chemistry like that. But we had a chance to know about uh, chemistry can be correlated with the AI. And we can be go with this uh, further research in this all those area so we get a chance to know about this we know the chemistry but how we don't how to collaborate with other uh, department like ai so that uh, we get a uh, somewhat uh, basic idea and a startup idea to collaborate with this uh, ai ma'am so thank you so much for this uh, wonderful the ftb we can know what the chance about the ai and the chemistry thank you ma'am thank you ma'am Thank you for your valuable feedback. Uh, the feedbacks which was given by you all participants will enrich us and do to our best uh, in upcoming years. Thank you. Now we have come to the concluding part of our program. I request Dr. R. Kanmani, Assistant Professor and the Organizing Secretary to deliver the vote of thanks. May I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Rosalie, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. I'm present. This oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Go to the next slide, ma'am. Wait, wait a moment. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, feedback form or the message to put on ma'am. It will have another call messages. Varla. Can many WhatsApp message to put on put on. Okay, ma'am. We will discuss later. Feedback form. Kindly mute yourself. Kindly mute yourself, ma'am. We will discuss later. Can many is it visible? No, ma'am. Alicia, start, ma'am. Ah, uh, I have shared. But it's just not. Yeah. It's no, ma'am, not yet shared, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, go to the first slide, ma'am. Rosalie, ma'am. I have shared. Okay, no problem, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. 
good evening to all ma'am shall i start ma'am yes yes can you go ahead yes, yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, good evening to all uh, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues but the parents of all others it's my great privilege to propose the vote of thanks for this five days international level online faculty development program on artificial intelligence in chemistry current trends and future perspectives and to acknowledge the contribution of those who worked really hard to make this fdp a grand success on behalf of the pg and research department of chemistry holy cross college trichy tamil nadu i extend my sincere gratitude to the chief guest of this valedictory function engineer abhijit nirkaji senior director data science and analytics bangalore thank you sir for adding a touch of grace and elegance by the august brother presents at the concluding session of this fdp i would like to express my profound gratitude to our secretary reverend sister dr ani savior and our dynamic principal reverend sister dr isabella rajkumari for the motivation and prayerful support to organize this faculty development program i am grateful to all the eminent speakers of the five days fdp dr n arul murugan associate professor indraprastha institute of information technology new delhi dr madhavan jacob assistant professor laila college chennai sri ranjani armugam head project management lepsic germany dr pathiban srinivasan visiting faculty aisar bopal and ms madangi tyagarajan project director fredrick national laboratory for cancer research esa for spending that time and the effort taken by each one of them to share the thoughts experience and research findings on artificial intelligence the speakers have created a good spark and gave new insight to the future research work we are very grateful to dr sriranjani arumugam our prestigious alumna for helping us in the arrangement of resource persons i am indeed grateful to the vice principals deans controller of examination heads of various department for the prayerful support and encouragement i would also like to thank our beloved head of the department and convener of this faculty limaros associate professor pg and research department of chemistry holy cross college for her constant support and guidance for conducting this faculty development program and even like this cannot happen overnight the wheel start rolling weeks ago it requires planning we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very proactive and dedicated organizing committee members dr j roslin vimala dr s vithya and dr m kavita assistant professor department of chem college for selecting this topic that is really very interesting and scope for the future research work a special note of thanks to all the moderators of the five days fdp dr j roslin vimala dr v priya dr l catherine dr s margaret shila dr j felicita florence and dr s vithya and teaching fraternity of our department for their unflinching support and coordination i also thank our non teaching staff for their support my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to all the participants for their active participation i hope you all have enriched your knowledge to the next level by attending this faculty development program because it is a very knowledgeable one and also improves our research area for the next era i acknowledge the team of technicians of hcc media house and student volunteers ms marishwari and ms abhinaya for the smooth conduct of this faculty development program through hc flamingo youtube channel last but not the least i thank god almighty for the successful completion of this faculty development program once again i thank you all thank you dr kanmani ma'am for your words of gratitude coming together as a beginning keeping together as a progress working together as a success i hold heartily wish each participants to be a successful person in your career and meet you all in another meet dear participants it is mandatory to fill the feedback form to get the certificate thank you
Thank you, Ms. Madangi. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, uh, Lima. Uh, yes, it's really nice. Uh, really, uh, really, it was a very, very, very nice session. So it was a wonderful opportunity for all of us to hear from you, your expertise. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank Absolutely. you very much. So I'll see you thank some you. other time. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, good evening, Stella. Ma'am, hearty congratulations, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hearty congratulations to all the staff, to all the organizers. That yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Successful okay. completion, ma'am. Nalla panin. And and up, um, uh, Vidya, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, organizers. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Really organized very, very, very well. And on all the uh, all the staff members you have supported very well to conduct this program. Thank you very much. Keep rocking. So how many were in uh, the YouTube channel uh, so today, Rose? I'm nearly 18, ma'am. OK, OK. Oh. In the middle, I saw it was 18, ma'am. Later, I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And today, also, Sri Ranjini, ma'am, joined the meeting. Oh, yeah. yes, I was uh, just I was <laughs> going uh, through this thing. But uh, mm -hmm. at that time, she didn't date. She was fully uh, in this mm -hmm. meeting. Okay, okay. So we have to thank her in a special way. Yes, ma'am. Now I spoke to the Sapajit sir also, and he asked whether it was useful because he delivered uh, to the yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely, it was much useful. But uh, since it's a validity function, so we didn't give time for a question session, right? Yes. Thank you, Felicita, for the nice uh, the moderation. Moderators, hello, me. So it was a. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Oh, yeah. It was very nice. Felicita, Vidya. Vidya, did you record the feedback from uh, the participants? Uh, the feedback. I'm group la podanum la ma'am. Mo yaro tam group la kipotta sulrang. Group la, but the group la venda nle. Na yaro or tam in between keta nle ma'am. Yaran teri. Venda ma'am. Na group la poda ma'am. Ongam the ingeda am feedback link kudu kramle. So let them feel. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, yes, can money. Ma'am, YouTube can wind up on it, ma'am. No, wind up on it, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can money YouTube la link one the chama? Ah, one the chama, one the chama. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, then, thank you all. Shall we leave? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. yes, thank, ma 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 yes, thank you, ma'am. 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 Thank you, ma'am.
it's a wonderful program ma'am yeah thank you suvia mm, yes ma'am thank yeah. you ma'am okay thank you pa thank you thank you ma'am i am an assistant professor of admc ma'am admc admc now now hub ma'am now but now right yes ma'am yes ma'am okay okay na thank you thank you ma'am thank you pa நினைக்கிறேன் <laughs> ஆனா நம்ம கிட்ட 90 something இருந்துச்சுல மா இந்தில கூகுள் மீட்ல ஆமா மா 90 இருந்தது பட் ஸ்டில் நவ 70 ரெஸ்பான்சஸ் தான் வந்து யார ஒருத்தம் வந்து கேட்டாங்களே மா இது வேணும்னு சொல்லி அவங்களுக்கு வேணா தனியா மெயில் பண்ணிரலாம் மா உங்களுக்கு ஏதோ another talk இருக்குன்னு சொல்லிட்டு இது ஒரு நேம் இருக்கு ஒரு விஷயம் ஏனா அவங்க ரெகுலரா வரவங்க தான் மா ரெகுலரா அந்த மா அட்டெண்ட் பண்றாங்க தனிப்பட்ட uh,